one. Hello and welcome to another episode of Educational. This is Roy. I'm Terry. So we are a podcast that we are going to chronicle our journey. Of course, we we both have aging parents, and uh, unfortunately, Terry has lost her dad. He uh, to Alzheimer's a few years ago, so she's been through that struggle and journey. And then, um, you know, from time to time, we are going to bring professionals on, and uh, we're very fortunate enough today that. Uh, Charisma Freeman has joined us. She is the founder of Charisma's Care Coaching and uh, Charisma Care, and she has 15 years of medical experience as a registered no- nurse, an adult geriatric nurse practitioner, disability advocate, special needs mom, educator, medical curriculum developer, certified life and wellness coach. And she's been featured on uh, 11 Alive News and Good Morning America and Focus. So, Charisma, thanks for taking time out of your day to be with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we are excited to talk to you. You know, we have uh, we've just launched, so we have a, a, a one episode that is out. But, you know, we're excited to bring this message. We know that a lot of people, a lot of families struggle as uh, loved ones age and then of course there's some of us that are are aging as well so we want to try to see what we can do for ourselves as as much but you know that the caregiver is in a very unique position because typically if i'm not mistaken it's usually the daughter-in-law that gets to carry the heavy load of caregiving for everybody and then uh, so not only does it make it hard on them but a lot of times they have to leave employment the caregiver does they have to leave employment so there's a financial burden but then also with our truly um, uh, truly sickest individuals that we care for uh, i think the numbers are staggering that 70 to 80 percent of caregivers will actually uh, pass before the person that they're caring for so it's just a it's a tough spot to be in and so we're fortunate enough to talk to you and uh, you've got a lot of great experience to kind of you know give us some tips to help us through this journey yeah yeah can you tell us definitely um go ahead it is a, a it is unfortunate that a lot of us caregivers do end up passing before our loved ones the ones that we're taking care of it's just so important for, I mean, all around just for you to take care of yourself, but especially if you're a caregiver, I mean, that's the best way that you can give care is to take care of yourself. So you have some great tools to do that. Can you, um, can you talk about um, what led you to, uh, br- to come out with Charisma's Care and, um, you know, your personal journey? And I know it's a, a lot, but your personal journey as well as your professional journey and how you kind of merged them together to do this? Yeah, of course. So uh, I began my life as a caregiver, I would say pretty young, probably as a child. My grandmother, like a lot of our parents and grandparents had arthritis in her knees. And, you know, I would sit with her and I would be sent to go get the witch hazel out the (laughs) out the cabinet. That was before I think that was before even Icy Hot. I think they just had the blue rub (laughs) at that point. So I would be sent to go get the witch hazel and, you know, I would rub it on her knee and I would tell her, you know, Grandma, when I grow up, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be a nurse or I'm going to be a doctor. And. You know, a lot of times, a lot of us say those things when we're younger, but I actually did that. I did just that, um, you know, right after high school, I went straight into college, into nursing school. Um, And over the years, when I initially went in, I thought I was going to be a nurse midwife and deliver babies until my first experience delivering babies. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) that would do it. (laughs) It was, yeah, it was not as glorious as I thought it would be. And, um, you know, over the years, I gravitated towards actually hospice and I worked in the hospice industry. Wow. And yeah, mm -hmm. I got to I got to hand it to you there. That is I don't know a lot about it. I do know enough to know that that is an emotional. uh, It's just an emotional stress of a of a job, because I know 
we we get attached to the people that we care for and in hospice unfortunately you know they are typically at the end of their life and so they're not with us that long right, right. yeah i tell people hospice as a nurse is more of a spiritual journey you're not just treating the physical you're treating the, the spiritual part of a person you're treating their physical you're treating their mental and emotional but more than anything else you're treating their family right yes right. that's a bigger part of it yeah i guess that providing that comfort to the family is definitely a uh, a big part of that job. I never really thought about yeah. that. Oh gosh. Yeah. My grandfather was mm-hmm. in it. He ended up going to an, a, a hospice care facility and oh my gosh, they were amazing. They were just amazing there. Mm-hmm. I, they had it together. You know, we were all falling apart at different times and they had it together and they just mm-hmm. led us through the steps. You know, and it had to have been hard for them. Yeah, and the other thing I know about Mm -hmm. hospice is that, um, you know, we typically tend to fight that off because, you know, the stigma attached around it is that the end is near if you're going on hospice. So, uh, but I think that it could provide a lot of comfort to the uh, families, but also, you know, ease the suffering of the uh, patients himself to, you know, as soon as your doctor recommends it is to just embrace it and uh, try to get, you know, try to get into it if you can. Yeah, what I actually found, I worked in all different um, divisions of hospice. I was the hospice nurse for many, many years. I worked as an admission nurse. I've worked in the hospital for it. And what I found is that really we don't refer our patients or people to hospice soon enough. Mm-hmm. What we do is we wait to the very end when the person is in agony, the pain can no longer be controlled. You know, they're extremely agitated, especially our dementia patients. By that time, they're just extremely agitated. It's so hard to get a um, handle on it instead of referring them a little bit earlier, because hospice is typically six, they say six months or less. But sometimes we have patients that's on hospice for a year or so. Um, But if we can get them on there earlier and we can start managing those symptoms, because it's more about symptom management. So if we can start managing those symptoms before mom loses 20 pounds, if we can get her when she lost those first 10 pounds or, you know, when her appetite is starting to decrease, you know, those things make a big difference. You, you treat the person. You're right. not treating the diagnosis in hospice. And right. that's what is so different from our typical medical profession. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, talking about that, getting in and, and treating their symptoms, we can, if I'm not mistaken, we can actually give a little bit more quality time for family members with their loved ones then like you said maybe that they're suffering and they keep fighting against whatever you know whatever the struggle is and um it can be it can that in itself can take a huge toll not only on the patient but on the family yeah it's definitely quality of life versus quantity of life and actually what studies have found is that patients on hospice care actually live longer than patients that are not on hospice care because they are receiving that regular care. I tell people, first of all, you've already paid for the, the hospice service. Right. Through, when you get it through Medicare, you already pay for it regardless of if you knew it or not. Right. So you pay for the nurse, the CNA, the social worker, the chaplain, the ability to do respite care. Yeah. Um, continuous care. You've you've paid for it, so why not take advantage of all of these services that are available to you at the end of life? Because yep. we all know that if it's nothing else that's promised, that it's the end of life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, you know what I guess is called dur- durable medical equipment that can come along with hospice to make life easier. Well, I know like, um, uh, you know, hospital beds and just other equipment that you can take advantage of to help make it easier on everybody as well. Yep. The overbed table, the, um, the high commode for uh, the patient. Um, we do specialty mattresses if their wounds are bad enough. 
uh, you know, wheelchairs, all of those different things yeah. that you're searching for. It's all covered under that one hospice benefit. Yeah. So the other thing that was interesting, I thought, is that, you know, you provide coaching to caregivers. And I mean, this could be at any point in time, but, you know, probably even just the sooner that people can get to you, the better off they will be, you know, if they're starting to have to provide more and more care to uh, family members because there's it's so involved and there's so many things that we don't think about. But, uh, you know, like check and mail, trip and fall hazards and just uh, again, we'll get back to the self-care of the caregiver themselves is that sometimes they need the respite care and get somebody in to help them, even if it's just for a few days or a few hours. Yeah, and what I found over the course of my career, once I got into geriatrics, and I just really loved it. But what I found is that a lot of time the caregivers, they weren't taking care of themselves at all. Right. You know, they weren't making their doctor's appointments. They weren't managing their blood pressure. They weren't taking medications for anxiety, and their anxiety was going through the roof. Yeah. I would see them. I do a lot of in-home visits. Even now, I visit my patients in the home. And most of the time, the caregivers say, when was the last time you ate? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I had a Snickers bar. When, right. You know, when was the last time you had a fruit or a vegetable? <laughs> right. When, you know, do you stop to go to the bathroom? When was the last time you had a moment for yourself to just, just woo sigh yeah. <laughs> and breathe? Yeah. And they don't think about that. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I think the message and, and I, you know, Terry alluded to this earlier is what we, what you have to realize as a caregiver is you want to be there to provide care for your loved one. We know that, but you have to think about the, the, um, it's, it's usually a marathon, not a sprint. And so you have to think about mm -hmm. if I may be here in the short run, but if I don't take care of myself, I'm not going to be here in the long run. And then who is going to take care of my loved one? Right. Right. And that's definitely a question I ask people. If you were to fall ill and end up in the hospital tomorrow, what would happen to mom, dad, grandma, grand, grandpa? Yeah. What would happen to them? Where would they go? Yeah. Because we don't consider that and we don't take the time to take care of ourselves, yeah. especially the natural caregivers. And you're normally the only person providing that care. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and if you happen yeah. to be a mom or a grandmother, um, then now you have passed the caregiving torch to your children, and now they're not only caring for you, but they're caring for the, the loved one that you were caring for, too. So we've just doubled down on, on that. Right. Yep, the sandwich generation. <laughs> yeah. The, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, I know I'm guilty of it. I, I can recognize, I sit back and recognize it now, it's speaking with you, especially that how important it is, you know, to take care of myself so I can make sure, you know, my mom's 80, 86, 87, yeah. I, 86. And um, I, she was in the hospital over in the, in the fall for, she was in ICU for a week and then in the hospital for a week and then physical therapy and occupational therapy, all that stuff, you know, we were just going, we were just going. And, and we actually kind of had a plan. She's just, he she's healthy. So this was just something that came up where she ended mm -hmm. up getting sepsis and all of that, but we just kept going, going, going. And I, I fortunately, I, my sister's close by, so she was able to help, but, um, you know, it's easy to say, but it's so much harder to do. <laughs> How do you? Well, because people mm -hmm. like, you know, like Terry, she would go over to her mom's in the evening and stay all evening, stay up overnight, and then come home and try to have a normal life during the day. <laughs> and, you know, after, come home and want to sleep. after a few days, <laughs> it was just not much more. And so, you know, one thing that we could talk about, I think here's a good transition, is planning. Uh, we never want to talk about somebody getting ill and uh but i think what i have found in my experience is because of lack of planning there's a crisis happens and then everybody is in panic mode trying to mm -hmm. solve it instead of you know there are things that we can talk about pre-crisis that will 
help. And, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll let you be the expert here and talk about that. But, you know, I think it goes from not only uh, providers that we use, wh- who's, what kind of medication are, are you on? Because the night that they went to the emergency room, you know, Terry uh, had a whole bag full of medicine sitting in the emergency room trying to cat- catalog all the different prescriptions. And so, to, you know, to me, those are things that we could do pre-crisis also uh she's fortunate enough she has two sisters that they get along well and we're able to coordinate the care but there can be dialogue about well if something happens who's going to do what and how do we work this out yeah definitely so one of the things that i offer on my website um, charismascare.com is i offer a free packet of information Um, i call it your care coach guide a caregiver's guide. And what that does is it documents all of those things you just mentioned. It tell, it documents who's the first and second emergency contact, um, the medications that your um, loved one is on, dosages, all of those things, diagnosis. I, I have a list of the most common, like 50 diagnoses. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's checkbox and some, you know, fill in the blank. I also um, add on there, uh, do you have a living will? Who's your power of attorney? Uh, Any specialist that you see? All of those things, you know, you can either save it on your phone or you can download and have a paper form of it. And that way you have it with you. And when I work with clients, what I do is, you know, I basically fall under Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So basically Maslow's hierarchy says, we have to take care of the basics, food, shelter, and water. Until we can take care of the basics, I can't tell you to let's go do yoga 30 minutes a day, three times a week, because you're looking at me like I'm a crazy lady. (laughs) So we need to make sure you're eating, you're sleeping, and mom and dad are taken care of. Right. So if you have, that's what makes me different than your average coach is that I like to kind of focus on the medical portion of it first to make sure they're comfortable answer any questions you have about that. Tell you how you can have that dialogue with your physician or, you know, how you create your team, all of those different things. And then once we can figure all of that out, then from there we can start to build up and focus more in on you as the caregiver. Yeah. You bring up a good point about the uh, powers of attorneys, not necessarily a will because that'll be after the fact, but the power of attorney, uh, living uh, wills and directives and all that. uh, Somebody needs to know where those are. Because because I know a lot of people that take the time to have all of that and then a catastrophe happens and then nobody can find them or we, you know, if they even know they exist, they don't know where they are. So again, good to, you know, let somebody know where it's at, but uh, you know, I don't even know, maybe there's a good spot to write down for somebody, you know, that you can, uh, it will trigger somebody, but definitely need to know where to go find uh, updated information as well. Nope. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Know where they are. Make sure it's been updated, not 20 years ago. Right. <laughs> Make sure it's been updated and have that conversation. A lot of people don't want to have that conversation. But, you know, I worked in the ICU and it was always so difficult when we had the family. There's five different siblings. Only one of them actually took care of mom. Nobody actually knew what mom wanted, but the one sibling and all the other ones were against her. If it's written down, then we simply pick up the paper and say, well, mom said she doesn't want to be on life support. Right. Well, the family dynamics really, oh my gosh, they, they really come into play when you're talking about the parents because everybody thinks... Each child thinks they know what that parent wants, you know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it happens a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I was a, uh, <clears throat> I relate this story all the time, but I was a uh, volunteer long-term care ombudsman in the state of Texas for a while. And so when I first started that, I thought we were there to protect residents uh, from the big bad communities and corporate providers. But 
Well, I quickly found out was we were there to protect them from their relatives and other family members. That's so sad. It's the, they were the most destructive that, you know, it, people don't realize it, but, you know, we have to put restraining orders on family members because we had a, a, a lady that would aspirate any time that she had solid food. And so there was one sister that she would come over and take her out to the all you could eat buffet and then she'd be sick for three days because she was uh, you know coughing and choking up everything anyway mm -hmm. that's kind of graphic i know but the pro the thing is is it gets back to if mom or dad or if we as individuals write down and document what we want then there's no question and we don't have to try to determine who is the who's the best mind reader in the family that really knows what mom and dad wants yeah, and that goes for spouses as well, because the other caregiver that we find that uh, is forgotten are the spouses. There are a lot of spousal caregivers out there, too, um, and they need to have that same conversation. Both of them should have, yeah. should do the, I, I tell people, oh, you're going to celebrate, go out to dinner, take this power of attorney, and go ahead and do that <laughs> while you're waiting on your meal to come to the table. Right. On Valentine's yeah. Day. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Do it together. Make it a special occasion, and then we're done with it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. One other thing I wrote down while we while y'all were talking earlier is uh, polypharmacy. I know that can be a huge um have a huge impact for older adults because they have different doctors and you know unfortunately sometimes they may seek out a doctor that tells them what they want to hear so they may have gone to four or five people but anyway do you see that that is a big problem because I, my 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 impression is that when you get a um, prescription you know the pharmacist should be looking at all that but what i found is that they don't always pick it up. So do you see that as a big problem or do you run into that a lot? Yes, especially with my elderly population, polypharmacy is a very big problem. So on the um, packet that I told you about, I do have them list the medications, but I also have a list of herbal supplements because you will be amazed how many herbal supplements people are on. And that is part of our polypharmacy because those herbal supplements also interact with those medications. Yeah. I also have them list their specialists um, because of course, in a perfect world, all the practitioners, all the doctors, all the specialists are talking but they're really not in our world. Right. They're really not talking. The use of the, you know, the my chart and the medical documentation has helped and it helps with pharmacists to see it, but you're still on so many medications. You know, um, one person is giving you metformin for diabetes and then the other person is finding that your kidneys are failing. So they're taking you off the metformin and putting you on something else, but your doctor didn't know that. So now your diabetes are, is out of control because yeah they need to put you on something else. Right. So it's really a matter of gathering everything. So that's why you really need to one, only use one pharmacy, please. If you mm -hmm. use one pharmacy, you are more likely not to have the issues with your medications interacting yeah. because that pharmacist will know what's going on. And to either write down all of those medications and herbal supplements and the um, essential oils, because that has come into play now, too. Wow. So write all, all <laughs> of that down or brown bag it, like we say. Put it all in a brown bag, bring it to your doctor and sit it on the table so they can just write them all out. Yeah. Yeah. And you might, if you don't mind, I just jumped into that without explaining what polypharmacy That's is. That's what so I was going to ask. Would Thank you me. mind just a simple explanation for the audience there? Basically, polypharmacy is when you have more than three or four medications. So when you start to have different ones, they all have different interactions. So we need to make sure that they're not causing different effects. Um, and different reactions in the body. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I mentioned metformin because that's a big one. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so what are some other tips that, uh, what are some other things that you can think about that uh, we need to, you know, be sure and remind caregivers that they need to take into consideration? 
So when you're going to the doctor, make sure you have your list of questions. I put a, I actually put a little spot on there too. Write down those questions before, because when I worked in the clinic, I literally had five or 10 minutes to see you. That's why clinic life wasn't for me. But my MA goes in there for the first 15 minutes she gets your information from you by the time i get in there i'm literally just there for what you said you came for if you're lucky i can focus on three things but most of the time i can only focus on one or two so if you have questions i really need you to know them and just fire them off right so write down you know those questions ahead of time and make sure you ask the person so that you're not like oh man once you walk out oh i forgot to ask her about this or mom fail and you know this happened yeah. or man i forgot you know we we needed an order for that x-ray yeah. so just make sure you write those that down ahead of time yeah i do that i mean i'm I, i've just now started writing out questions because I, i'm so overwhelmed in all aspects of my life that i just when i go to the doctor mm-hmm. it's like hey i get there and he tells me you know he tells me what's going on and then i leave and i'm like wait a minute what about yeah. that and that and that? Yeah. yeah, and the other thing is... And make is, sure you let them know about new things. About what? About anything new. Anything. If there's been yes. a fall, an injury, a, I, I encounter patients all the time. When I come see them in the home, they're like, oh, yeah. I'm like, where's that bruise from? Oh, mom fell and hit her knee and she couldn't walk for a couple of days. I said, well, did you let your doctor know? Well, no. When was the last time you saw your doctor? Yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. We had to go through mom's um, apartment and, and take it when she did physical therapy and occupational therapy, they would come in and we took, she had all these throw rugs. I hate a yes. throw rug. Not the throw rugs. I <laughs> hate a throw rug. <laughs> we had to take them all up. She's, we hid them. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a please take away the throw rugs. Oh. You know, and that the the fall in itself may not be bad, but I think a lot of times we don't realize the implications because you know, one thing I say is um a lot of times people don't want to go where they can get a little more assistance because they think that they want to retain their independence. Yeah. But when you fall, you break a hip and you don't recover, now you've totally lost any and all independence and then unfortunately sometimes that can be the trigger for pneumonia and then things just go downhill from there yeah it's it's been very often where i will have a patient that's fallen and then that will be their downward spiral so right and it, it definitely happens yeah it yeah. is it's so important to uh you know get out in front of that for sure uh The other thing I think that it's good to realize that you really have a right to ask questions. So if somebody is putting you off or not answering them fully, and I realize that, you know, doctors are are crushed for time because they have a lot of appointments and they're moving through. But at the very least, they should try to answer your questions or you uh, sometimes you can email the office and get answers but don't ever don't ever hesitate or feel like that you cannot ask questions yeah yeah and i tell patients if you feel like you have a doctor and it's that person you you all just don't get along or they're just not the person for you know that it's okay to look at look for other doctors there's a multitude of doctors out there. Your insurance covers 99.9% of them. Yep. Even if you've been with this doctor for 15 years, sometimes it may be necessary to see another doctor. And in that same token, it's okay to get a second opinion. Sometimes we welcome a second opinion, you know, because you may need that. That second opinion may save your loved one's life. That's right. So um, definitely make sure you do that. Yeah, my mom, uh, I keep going back to my mom. Well, that's my, that's my reference. Um, about five years ago, maybe, um, she was diagnosed, she had a fall and was in the mm-hmm. hospital. And one of the doctors there diagnosed her with um, Parkinson's disease because she had some mm-hmm. little tremors. So for about six months, she was on some medication 
I, I can't remember what it was called, but what, whatever it is for, for Parkinson's. And yeah. they gave her symptoms. <laughs> I mean, the, the side effects of the medication gave her more mm -hmm. symptoms of Parkinson's. We went to like mm -hmm. three or four doctors and found one, he, he was like, he said, okay, just stare straight ahead. I'm going behind you. And he kind of pulled her shoulders a little bit. And he's like, you do not have Parkinson's. And I'm going to show mm. you why. I mean, weaned her off of it, nothing. You know, she has a little bit of shake, but not mm. not anything like, it, it was just really frustrating after the fact, but right. so thankful that somebody found it. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and, I can imagine. Yeah, no, we've grown up respecting the medical profession yeah. and doctors, but and not you know, I think yeah, not questioning and are being uh, you know being timid to ask a question or you know make them think we are questioning them. So it, it's good, and I, I think that do, uh, most uh, I don't want to say I don't know how to say it, but most good doctors will welcome that second opinion or they will understand why you right. feel like you need more information they will not make you feel bad so you right. know don't don't hesitate to do that for sure yeah yep. um it's definitely necessary and like you said most doctors if they're a good doctor they don't mind you getting that second opinion right. not at all right all right well uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your day. The other thing I was going to mention is um, you do offer an essential skills training course. So, uh, number one, I'll let you in a minute. You can tell us where we can go find that. But I think, uh, you know, people need to reach out and get some information from you. And then there's also this training course that would be good. Uh, before we get to all that, I was going to ask you, what is a tool or a, uh, a habit or a ritual? What's something that you do in your everyday life that uh, just, it adds value for you? Well, for me, I am a caregiver as well. My son has special needs. So in addition to managing my business and I still see patients and managing him and my daughter, I am a big fan of my uh, Google Calendar. If okay. I did not, have, yeah. <laughs> if I did not have my Google Calendar on the phone, I don't know what I would do. You know, um, I send whenever we have something going on and someone has to be invited. I put their name into the Google Calendar for my daughter. If we have a doctor's appointment, I put her email in, and she knows she has an appointment. Oh. Things are color coded on there. You know, oh for my, my daughter, it's one color. Nice. For my for doctor's appointments, those are always in red, so I know that those are the doctor's appointments. Okay. If they're little things, they're in a different color, so I make sure. And everybody knows if you're not in my calendar, you're not getting done. <laughs> my daughter will put things in my calendar to make sure that it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's important. And the, the good thing about the Google Calendar is it goes across all your devices where it, it, it you know, it's not just one Everything. thing that's on your phone, but it'll go across your devices. And like you said, you can share it where other trusted people can put stuff on and put appointments on there as well trusted yeah people. trusted i want to emphasize <laughs> that kids might want to put pizza in there every yeah. once in a while yeah right <laughs> right right but i mean you one thing that i found with the google calendar if you use it long term sometimes i can look if i'm at an appointment i can look back and they'll say well, when was that surgery? And I can look back two years ago, because I'm like, I think it's around April. I can slide back two years ago in April and say, oh, it was April 15th. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. Well, thanks for that. So if you don't mind, tell us, number one, who is your client, what you can do for them, and then, of course, how they can reach out and get a hold of you. But also, you may want to talk a little bit uh, about this essential uh, skills training course that you've got. So the essential skills training course, it's for the family caregiver. And what it does is it's a pre-recorded course where I go through about 10 modules and we discuss things like feeding, we discuss transfers, bathing, um, we discuss medication management. And the reason why I created it, someone actually asked me for it because they were going through caregivers, especially during COVID. And whenever they would hire a caregiver, 
the expectation would be that the caregiver was already trained, but rarely are the caregivers that we're hiring already trained. Whether we hire them directly or we hire them from a company, we find that they come in here and they don't know what, what to do. Right. So I created the training for that caregiver, or if your family member's going to respite, or you're bringing in a family member that's not typically here, they can take that training. It has questions at the end if you want them to you know, do the questions, and they can take this training. It goes through all of these different modules. And then at that point, the only thing you really have to update them on are things that are very specific to your loved one. So you're not repeating the same thing over and over and over. And you know that everybody knows yeah. all of the same information. Yeah. So that's why. I created that. Yeah. No, that's a good point. That is be- really good. Because everybody's a little different anyway, but it's good to just go through the specifics of your loved one and make sure because a lot of people tell you that they care or have cared for other people and may not be may not be totally truthful or it may have been somebody that had a little different diagnosis that needed different types of care. Mm-hmm. So no, that's a good point to instead of in, instead of just assuming that they have because they have the caregiver uh, name exactly. or that's what they're applying for or whatever that they know what mm-hmm. they're doing, yeah. they have to know. Yeah. Well, you can't assume that. You got to make sure. Yep, and the CNAs are the same because they may have worked with one client that didn't need any help with transfers or didn't have any feeding issues or any tube feedings or anything of that nature. So this just make, levels the playing field and makes sure everyone's on the same page. And now as far as who my client is, my client are caregivers. So I found that the caregivers, they're, you know, they're not sleeping, they're not eating, they're not taking care of themselves. And I see that time and time again, and then they end up ill, they end up stressed out, they end up on all of these medications to help them manage this anxiety, stress, depression, you know, help them. And nobody's leading them, nobody's saying, okay, if we manage this part of your life, then that in turn will help you manage that stress and anxiety and, you know, all these things and that caregiver breakdown that we sweep under the rug because nobody really looks at us caregivers. Right, right. So that's why I created the coaching program. So I offer a coaching program. Um, my first call is always free. So we sit down and I do it via Zoom or phone. It just depends on what your comfort level we sit down, we talk about what's going on and where you are in your journey, and we can do coaching or some people you just do a call every so often where they just want to go over medicate, medications, medical jargon, just get an understanding of what's going on in their loved one's life. So I offer a little bit of both um, in addition to the courses and probably some group trainings in the future because I've been asked a lot <laughs> about doing some group trainings as well. but. I just want people to um, have some help because like I said, I was, I'm a caregiver. I care for my grandmother until she actually passed away. She passed away in hospice as well. I'm sorry. I care for her for, thank you. I care for her for years as well. And I mean, I always juggled so much and there was really no one caring for me. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. And I think the other uh, component that's impressive about yourself is that, you know, you do have the nursing the nurse practitioner experience to go along with that caregiving experience. So that's a, you're walking the walk. I mean, you're not just talking. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great background. So how can people, uh, and we will put this in the show notes, but how can people reach out and uh, get a hold of you? Okay. So uh, my website is charismascare.com and I make everything easy. Facebook is charismas care Instagram is Charisma's Care. All right. <laughs> so on, on Facebook, I do a um, Facebook Live every Friday at 10 to 10.30 a.m. And I talk about different topics. Um, we talk about um, short-term disability and FMLA and how you can utilize oh. that to care for your loved one. Um, we talk about... Um, having the documentation and what you should have and they'll, they'll, in your documentation when you go to your doctor's office and what you sh- the documents you should request and the ones you can just toss. So all of those are on my Facebook. I'm working on getting it to my Instagram, but I do those every week. So they're on there for people to go take a look okay. at. 
Um, so, you know, I'm just always trying to educate the public because this information shouldn't be hidden from us. Exactly. It should be in plain sight. Yeah, and that's a, it's a huge point that you make because uh, it, when, when crisis strikes, it's like trying to find the information. And the other thing, too, is like if you've got a month or six weeks to search and Google and call people, you, you know, you can find what you're looking for. But a lot of times, unfortunately, when you get, have that crisis mode, it's like, man, we need this information immediately today, right now, mm -hmm. because that tends to drive up the stress even more not only what event just happened but not having all the correct information that well, and sometimes you don't even know what information you need that's a good point yeah we don't know <laughs> what we don't know where do you go <laughs> right yeah. right so that's what i put on there and it prevents you from having to do extra tests and doing the same things over and over and a lot of that stuff you can just request you don't have to know where it is yeah yeah they can just give it to you all right well, Charisma, uh, we appreciate it. Y'all reach out to Charisma and, and go over to the face, her Facebook page and, and watch some of these short videos. I know that they'll be very helpful. Oh, my goodness. No matter where, uh, you know, what part of the journey you're in as a caregiver. Uh, start earlier. Don't wait to, till you get yourself in crisis. Reach out and uh, figure out how to be uh, not only the best caregiver for your loved one, but the best caregiver for yourself as well. Yeah. All definitely. right. Definitely. Thank well, you so much, Charisma. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Yes, it has. You're so yeah. welcome. Thank you yeah. for having me. You bet. Doing good work. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for another episode of Educational. Uh, again, you can find us at www.ageucational.com. We are on all the major podcast platforms, iTunes, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, and many more. If we're not on your favorite one, if you'll reach out to me, I'll be glad to try to get us uh, get you added on. We are also on all the major uh, social media platforms, Facebook. There's a Facebook group. We'd like to get some uh, group chats going on there. Try to, you know, uh, put, put ever, whatever questions you may have, put them out there. Somebody's been through or going through what you are. Try to uh, reach out and help as many people as we can. Also, Twitter, Instagram, and a um the video of this interview will once the episode goes live this video will be up on youtube for you to go to as well so until next time uh, this is roy this is terry thank you thank you